It is good to be able to study together tonight. We'll be heading to Ohio later this week to be with my in-laws for a few days. I'm looking forward to that, but I will not be able to be with you this coming Lord's Day. Hans Jensen will be preaching this coming Sunday, and I certainly hope to catch his lesson online after the fact. But I do hope that all of you will be, will be able to come together this coming Sunday as we come back to our study of 2 Timothy. And that'll be at 9.30 Sunday morning, and then we'll meet for worship at 10.30. So I hope that you are able to be there for that. Uh, tonight we are continuing in our almost brand new study of the book of Genesis. It is a book of beginnings. This is what the word Genesis means. It's written by Moses, at least a vast majority of it was. In chapter 1, we learned about the creation. We've got a very brief summary of the first six days, followed by a day of rest in the opening verses of chapter 2. And then in chapter 3, we go back to a more detailed explanation of the creation of man and woman on day number 6. And uh, day number 6 in chapter 2 is a lot more personable. You may remember we have not just a reference to God, Elohim, but we have a reference to the Lord God using uh, the YHWH or Yahweh or Jehovah as it is sometimes translated. Or in our Bibles, most modern translations, the word Lord in all capital letters, which is his personal covenant name. So with the relationship between God and the newly created man and woman, we have that addition in chapter 2 that we really didn't have in chapter 1. So that's where we've been, chapter 1, the creation, chapter 2, uh, focusing in on the creation of man and woman. So in chapter 3, we go back for a more detailed explanation. And um, the man and the woman are placed in this beautiful garden. They've got this uh, beginning of marriage itself at the end of chapter 2. And the last verse of chapter 2 tells us, that the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Well, that changes tonight as we move into chapter 3. So tonight we're in our first paragraph. This is Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves loin coverings. In verse 1, we're introduced to the serpent, and Moses tells us that the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And obviously, there are many things we might wish we knew about the serpent at this point. A lot of questions remain unanswered at this point in the Bible, but this is all we have here. The serpent speaks, and what he does is try to cause the woman to question what God has said. This past Sunday, we talked about the danger of false teachers as we studied 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I think it's very safe to say, obviously, the serpent is the original false teacher. And I hope we notice how he's trying to get the woman to doubt or to question what God has said. And he does this with a question. And I know so many times today we've seen people do this, and when we call them out on it, uh, they'll often say, Oh, but I was, I was just asking a question. And that's the way to try to kind of wiggle or maybe slither their way out of it, maybe more accurate based on this context, as if we are the ones who have a problem with people asking questions. But I think most of us understand that there are many different kinds of questions, aren't there? There are honest questions where we really want to know an answer to something we don't know. Maybe we're genuinely confused about something, and so we ask somebody who we think might have the answer. And then there are, of course, there are other questions where people are not asking for information's sake, but they are asking to create doubt and division. So we may hear someone refer to uh, somebody playing the devil's advocate, and in a sense, that's what we see going on here. But the devil has enough advocates, doesn't he? Uh, someone can cause a lot of trouble by asking dishonest or manipulative questions, and that's what the serpent does in verse number one. Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? 
And as I look at that question, and especially as we look at what comes next, the serpent is trying to get the woman to see God as being unreasonable. And so he's sowing seeds of doubt here. He's trying to make God seem overbearing, isn't he? Or maybe overly strict, we might say. Uh, ultimately trying to get the woman to ignore God's instructions. And I say this because God never said that she couldn't eat from any tree. And the serpent, therefore, was misquoting or misrepresenting the Lord's instructions here. And it's interesting to me to wonder, uh, how did the serpent know what God had said? And I know we've mentioned this before, but I'm highly confident that Satan knows the Bible better than any of us do. And I say that because he's had thousands of years to analyze it. Satan has had thousands of years to memorize the Word of God, and that certainly makes him especially dangerous. And it also shows us how important it is uh, for us to know it, because he's after us, and he knows the Word of God better than we do, and we need to know it as best we can. In verse number two, the woman replies to the serpent, clarifying what the Lord had actually said. They can eat from uh, the trees of the garden, but they're not to eat from one particular tree in the middle of the garden. And she seems to get this right, although she doesn't name the tree, as she probably should have done. Uh, but then she seems to add something that really wasn't in the original command. I hope we caught that. Notice in verse 3, she quotes God as saying, You shall not eat from it, or touch it, or you will die. Well, if we turn back over to Genesis chapter 2, and we read through chapter 2 a few times, we really don't see God telling them not to touch it. And that may or may not be significant, but I think there's a chance that the serpent trying to make God more strict than he is, is maybe rubbing off on the woman. So instead of not just eating from the tree or not eating from it, she now has apparently added the prohibition against touching it. And so she's, she's biting, she's going for the bait on the hook. And now obviously um, not touching the tree is probably a wise decision. If God said don't eat it, there's probably a lesson here about, um, you know, staying away from temptation, that kind of thing. And so if God says, don't eat something, maybe we shouldn't be uh, playing around with it or, or touching it either. But at the same time, um, maybe there's a good lesson here about properly understanding God's construct uh, instructions and certainly not making them either more strict or even less strict than they really are. Because when we misunderstand the actual commands, it really makes it more difficult to obey those actual commands. And so I guess we need to be very careful that we understand God's word as best we can. The other concern here is that Eve seems to back off just a tiny bit on the certainty of death, doesn't she? And I think I can say that very safely based on uh, not just this, but some of the other translations, I believe, make this a bit more clear. But here she references death as a possibility. But God's original statement was, for in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. And it's a little bit different here, isn't it? To me, Eve's restatement of the original command is just a little bit softer than uh, God's original statement in this regard. So she's more strict in the sense of not even touching the tree, but at the same time, she seems to be less strict as to the absolute certainty of death, as God had originally warned. So we have a loosening of his commands, and we also have a tightening of his commands beyond what he actually said. Well, obedience is obviously hard enough as it is, but having inaccurate information makes it obviously more difficult. So the woman then adds a prohibition against touching the tree, but she eases up a little bit on the consequences of eating the fruit. So she's sliding down this slippery slope in this discussion she's having with the serpent. If she'd simply been able to accurately quote the original command, uh, she might have had a much better chance of surviving this spiritually intact. In verse number four, the serpent replies, and now he's not just uh, making a subtle shift in what God has said. Uh, now, she, I think he sees her as being more vulnerable now. I've got her a little bit confused in both directions. And so now the serpent is outright contradicting what the Lord has said. So he's taken it to the next level. You surely will not die. He changes one word here. But obviously, this one word makes all the difference. We think about what Peter said, baptism now saves you. A lot of people today would add the word, baptism does not now save you. And I've actually seen that word added in some uh, denominational bulletin articles and a list and that kind of thing. I mean, by adding one little word like that, obviously, it can uh, totally change the meaning of the command. And Satan doesn't leave it there, does he? In verse 5, notice the serpent gives a reason why God would be so unreasonable. So it's like, the serpent is saying, I'm this reasonable creature, God is not. 
And so in making this argument, the serpent says, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the serpent's not just lying by reversing this command, but he's actually undermining God's authority. He is undermining God's credibility with the woman at this point. He's accusing God of having ulterior motives for keeping them from eating from this one particular tree. God is holding something back from you. He's generating a sense of jealousy or maybe pride or maybe resentment in the woman's heart. You know, who does God think that he is to be telling you what to do? He's just holding you back from this. He's keeping something from you. Uh, obviously, uh, the serpent is making this argument that God is less than good. He is not worthy of being listened to or obeyed. So Satan is basically saying, if you follow me, you'll have the rich, fulfilling, uh, awesomely happy life that you deserve. Well, Eve doesn't realize, though, that she already has a rich and fulfilling life. She's living in paradise. Things are absolutely perfect for her at this moment. But it seems that Satan is making her feel unfulfilled, that uh, God is holding something back. So with this new information from the serpent, uh, the woman now thinks she has what she needs to make a good decision. So in verse 6, as she processes this information, she now observes with her own eyes. And based on her newly found wisdom from the reasoning or misunderstanding, misreasoning from the serpent, um, outside of God's command, and she notices in a way that maybe she hadn't noticed before that the tree, number one, was good for food. She also notices that it is a delight to the eyes, so it looks good, so it's going to taste good, it looks good. And then she also notices, thirdly, that it is desirable to make one wise. And so she decides on her own, without consulting God, without consulting her husband on this, to take from its fruit and to eat it. And certainly all of this reminds us of 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, where John says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Do we see all three of those categories in both passages? And, um, you know, we, we've got it there in 1 John 2, 16. We also have it back here in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, in fact, we see the same three categories also in Satan's temptation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. And if you can think back with me to Matthew chapter 4, we won't read that whole account, but uh, we've got the lust of the flesh, don't we? The idea that, um, you know, that uh, Jesus needed this, the fruit was good for food. In Jesus' case, the temptation to turn the stones into bread. Uh, secondly, we have the lust of the eyes, the idea that the fruit was a delight to the eyes. And in Jesus' case, with his temptation, Satan taking him to a high mountain, showing him all of the kingdoms of the world. And then thirdly, we've got the boastful pride of life, the idea that the tree was desirable to make one wise, kind of appealing to her pride. And in Jesus' case, Satan basically daring Jesus to jump off the pinnacle of the temple so that he would be rescued by angels, attracting attention, wowing the crowds, and uh, kind of appealing to his ego there. Uh, so these three avenues of temptation, they were used by Satan in the garden, they were used by Satan with Jesus, and they continue to be used today. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. If we study Eve's failure and Jesus' success in facing those three temptations, we have a path forward, don't we? Unlike Eve, Jesus responded to all three temptations by accurately quoting scripture. And we would do well to do the same as we're tempted today. But to quote it under pressure, we've got to know it. And that's why we study together and also uh, on our own. Uh, and then to top off the eating of the fruit herself, notice here at the end that the woman also convinces her husband to eat. Um, in this case, instead of providing leadership as he should have done, instead of saying, no, God told us not to do this, Instead of doing that, the man follows, yes, dear, and then he partakes of the fruit that he's handed by his wife. And this brings us down to verse 7, where we start to see some consequences. Um, do they suddenly have the peace and the happiness and the fulfillment that Satan seems to have promised? Uh, no, obviously just the opposite. Their eyes are opened indeed, uh, but they immediately realize that they are naked. They have this awareness that something has changed. It's like their eyes have been opened. This is what this is all about. Uh, before, I would say they were almost like children. And that little children, they've got, they have no idea that they're naked. Uh, but they grow up and they get to a point where, whoa, you know, this is, a, this is a problem here. So now their eyes are opened and they immediately try to cover themselves. They take fig leaves, they sew them together and they make for themselves loin coverings. 
Uh, I had not really thought about this until today, but I'd forgotten that there was um, sewing involved here. I mean, we think of some of the artwork in the Vatican and uh, around the world where the statues might be covered with a single fig leaf, if you can uh, remember some of that. Uh, the man and the woman here, though, they sewed fig leaves together and they made, they created for themselves loin coverings or maybe aprons, as some of the translations say. They were frantically trying to cover themselves. As far as we know, they hadn't done much sewing prior to this. This is uh, uh, the beginning of sewing, we might say. Uh, Genesis, again, being a book of beginnings. Uh, previously, there had been no need for sewing, as far as we know. Imagine being so desperate to cover ourselves, though, that we invent sewing for the very first time. Uh, but this goes back to this apparent sense of shame that they have. Something had changed, and they have this feeling, this problem, uh, that they did not have before. Well, let's continue on with the next paragraph. This is Genesis chapter 8, or Genesis chapter 3, rather, verses 8 through 13. Genesis 3, 8 through 13. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. When the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Notice in verse 8, they hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. And I just want to point out here at the beginning, notice we're back to the reference to the Lord God. Uh, as I remember it, I, I don't have the ability to go back easily here, but in that previous paragraph, as Satan is appealing to God, he refers to him not as the Lord God, but God. And so he's using that less personal name. But now we're back to this personal relationship. And in fact, the idea of that relationship being broken. But they hide. Um, as if we can hide from God, but we try, even today sometimes we try. Uh, maybe you have seen the meme of, a, I'd say, a pretty large construction worker in kind of a neon reflective shirt hiding behind a telephone pole. And obviously he's uh, kind of sticking out on both sides there. He's kind of glowing with the reflective vest. And the caption says this, you know, how you look trying to hide sin from God. And uh, certainly that is, that is what it looks like. There's no way for us to hide from God, but we do have a tendency to try. And that's what Adam and Eve are doing here. They are hiding from God among the trees in this garden. Uh, but in this context, God nevertheless calls out to the man. And I do find it interesting that God calls to not the woman, but he calls to the man. Even though the woman was the first to sin. And if we were together tonight, I would ask, why is this? Why does God call out to Adam and not Eve, even though God gave the original command to Adam and even though Eve was the first to sin? Well, we're not given the details of this. In my opinion, it's probably because God gave the command directly to Adam, even before Eve was created. I don't know whether you remember this from our study a week or two ago, uh, but God gave the command directly to Adam, even before Eve was created. And um, so he gives, he creates man, he gives this command not to eat of this particular tree, then he creates the woman. And so we put that together, we assume that it was then the man's responsibility to tell the woman what God had said uh, before she had come along. So God then starts not by confronting Eve, even though she was the first to sin, but he confronts Adam because Adam is the one he told about this. And the first contact here comes in the form of a question. Notice in verse number nine, where are you? Now, did God not know where Adam was? I think it's pretty clear to me that um, uh, God is asking this question not for his own benefit, but for Adam's benefit, isn't he? He's giving Adam a chance to come forward. It reminds me of interacting with, uh, with our children, right? Sometimes we ask a question we know the answer to. We know what they've done, but we may ask, what have you done in an attempt to start that dialogue? Instead of starting out in an accusing way, it's often better uh, to have the other person have a chance of, uh, you know, responding to that in this honorable way by admitting it, first of all. And so he's giving Adam, I think, a chance to come forward, a chance to confess. So he doesn't start by um, accusing or condemning, but he starts with this question. He starts by opening this dialogue. And Adam responds, I heard the sound of you in the garden, 
And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself, or at least he tried to hide himself. And this, by the way, is the first time that we find a reference to fear in the Bible. Remember, Genesis is a book of beginnings. Genesis is a book of first. And I believe this is the first reference to fear in the Bible. In verse 11, God responds with yet another question. He's still not accusing or condemning at this point, but he's probing. Again, not for his own benefit. God knows the answers to all of these questions. Uh, but he's asking for Adam's benefit. Who told you that you were naked? God knows the answer to that. And then he straight up asks, have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And this, of course, sets off a string of blaming, passing the buck, as we might say, in our culture. In a sense, Adam blames the woman. But who is Adam really blaming? Down there in verse 12. He's blaming God, isn't he? The woman whom you gave to be with me. She gave me from the tree and I ate. So notice there, Adam takes this amazing blessing from God and he portrays her almost as something of a curse in his life. And he throws this back on God. Ultimately, God, you are to blame. You did this to me by giving me this woman who tempted me to sin. Lord, this is all your fault. Well, at this point, God turns to the woman and says, what is this you have done? Okay, so he's going down the line here. And she's next. And the woman says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So God confronts Adam. Adam blames Eve and ultimately God himself. And then Eve passes it on and blames the serpent. Nobody's responsible here. Nobody uh, straight up says, I'm sorry, Lord, I did it. I sinned. I, I made a mistake by eating from the tree. You told me not to do it and I did it. Nobody says that here. And don't we have a way of doing the same thing today? It seems as if nobody is truly responsible for anything anymore. All of us have a reason. All of us have something or someone we can blame. And this obviously goes all the way back to the beginning. Um, there will, however, be some consequences. Even though we may blame our sin on others, uh, there is always a reckoning. So let's continue with God's response to the blame game. This is uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. As I said earlier, there is so much more we wish we knew about the serpent at this point. I have questions, and I'm sure you do as well. But this is what we do know. God curses the serpent. Because he had deceived the woman in this way, God basically demotes the serpent. I think that'd be safe to say, uh, causing him to slither around on his belly. Uh, was he able to walk around upright on two legs before this? I'm thinking, you know, the Geico critter. Um, apparently there was more mobility, but again, there's so much we don't know here. What we do know is that the serpent is now cursed. Um, eat dust. And that's kind of a figure of speech, I believe. Maybe not necessarily eating dust, but I think we have the same insult from time to time. If somebody tells us to eat dust, uh, I think we understand what that means. Uh, the really important part, I believe, comes down in verse 15. As God places enmity, that is, uh, hostility, our hatred, kind of a uh, stressed relationship uh, between the serpent and the woman, between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. Uh, I normally don't think of the serpent as having descendants. But if we're talking about Satan here, which I think that we are, obviously in hindsight we look back and there's a lot we learn later after this passage. But we think of what Jesus said in John 8, 44, uh, with reference to the scribes and the Pharisees and a lot of the other religious leaders in general. He said, you are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him whenever he speaks a lie he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies so in a sense satan truly does have descendants doesn't he uh, not literally in the, think, in the way that we think of descendants today, but certainly those who follow in his footsteps, I think are described there by Jesus in John 8 as being his descendants. He refers to your father, the devil. When people do the devil's work, they are in a sense the 
uh, descendants or the seed of Satan. Probably the most important part of this passage, though, comes at the very end where we learn that the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent on the head and the serpent will bruise the seed of the woman on the heel. It is the difference between a head wound and a wound on the heel. Both hurt, but one is obviously much worse than the other. And my understanding of this is that, it's, that this is a reference to Jesus' death and resurrection. In his death on the cross, Jesus suffered a painful uh, but not permanent wound. In the resurrection, Satan suffered a fatal head-crushing blow. And as I understand it, this is the first prophecy in all of Scripture. We just touched on this a few weeks ago in that short study of prophecy that we did. So let's continue then with God's statement to Eve. So he's working his way back up, I guess, the chain of command or the chain of blame here. So let's look at what God said to Eve. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. These are her consequences. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. So first of all, for her sin, Eve has promised a multiplication of pain in childbirth. And apparently, we learn here, childbirth was originally designed to be rather painless, at least compared to the way that it is now. Uh, we think in other parts, like of the animal kingdom, that childbirth does not seem to be as uh, painful by any means as it is for a human being. So something changes at this point in the curse, where childbirth, uh, the pain of childbirth is multiplied. Uh, the second part of this is that God seems to reinforce a sense of structure, or maybe we might say hierarchy in the family. Uh, yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And it seems that this goes back to Eve bypassing her husband in eating that forbidden fruit, even though he was the one who was first given the command. Uh, that word desire is used, I think, in the next chapter. We'll get to this in a couple weeks, but uh, where I think sin's desire for uh, Cain, we'll get to, maybe I'll repeat this at that time, look into that a little bit more, but there's been some idea here that maybe um, Eve will constantly be in a state of trying to overthrow her husband's authority. And yet, ultimately, that will not be beneficial or that will not work well. And her life will not be pleasant over the long run as a result of that constant challenging of his uh, authority as a husband. That's been uh, some, a lot of writing been done on that, obviously. Uh, but this is the curse for, uh, for the woman. So let's continue with, uh, with uh, God's statement to the man. This is Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return." I think we need to clarify in verse 17 that uh, Adam is not simply condemned for listening to the voice of his wife. Uh, as husbands, we are not able to quote verse 17 and say, look, Adam was condemned for listening to his wife. I'm not going to make the same mistake. That's not the point of verse 17, obviously. But more specifically, in context, he's condemned for listening to her instead of listening to God. That's the problem here, isn't it? He knew what God said was true and it was a valid warning don't eat the fruit of this particular tree or you'll die but instead he chose to listen to his wife eve was deceived into eating the fruit but adam sinned knowingly adam knew better but he sinned anyway so he wasn't tricked into it adam made a decision to follow his wife instead of leading her in the godly direction. So for this reason, God curses the ground. So instead of just walking around picking stuff to eat all day long, uh, Adam will now have to work for his food, and he'll have to work hard. The ground will now grow thorns and thistles. The ground will now grow creeping Charlie. Okay, I've added that part in there, but in my mind, man, that it is a constant battle. I don't know about at your house, but here it is. Uh, it is a constant war with Creeping Charlie. He wants to take over the universe back there. 
and it is just this uh, constant war, this constant struggle. So the ground will now grow thorns and thistles. Growing food will be difficult. It'll be hard work. It'll be a challenge. It'll be uncomfortable. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread. Again, I don't think we have any farmers at the Four Lakes congregation, as far as we know. Um, so we've somehow managed to avoid the curse, haven't we? We're not cursed these days. Uh, no, I don't think that's right. I think we are living under the curse. Ultimately, all of us are working for bread, aren't we? And often, work can be miserable. Work is hard. Um, we might work in a field directly, chopping weeds, pulling vegetables, you know, by the sweat of our brow, that kind of thing. But often today, we work for our bread indirectly, don't we? We sit at a desk, we manage a classroom, we design widgets for a living, whatever we do to earn our bread, um, almost every profession has some kind of a downside. There's something about it that is hard or unpleasant at certain times, and I believe we can thank Adam for that. And let's just remember, work itself is not the curse. Work isn't cursed. Work is good. I remember work was given to Adam naming the animals, managing the garden. All that thing came before the first sin and, and the curse here. The curse is the fact that our work on this earth will be made difficult by thorns and thistles. So let's not mix that up. Let's not think that work itself is a curse. Work is a blessing. It's an awesome thing to be able to do something that we enjoy doing and to earn a living for our family and to put food on the table. Um, but the problem is there are, there are issues that come along with almost everything we may choose to do for a living. And those challenges, I believe, ultimately go back uh, to this curse uh, given to Adam. Then we come to the, uh, the death part. Uh, Adam doesn't die immediately. He's not struck dead on the spot. Of course, that'd be the end of everything right here. I don't think we have kids involved at this point. Uh, but in a sense, God passes the sentence of death immediately right here on the spot. So Adam is now in the process of dying. You are a dead man walking, we might say. And the plan is that Adam will ultimately return to the ground from dust to dust, as we sometimes say. I know I've mentioned this a number of times before, but a few years ago I preached a funeral. Somebody in the family wanted the uh, verse to be read publicly, uh, uh, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. And it sounds very biblical, doesn't it? And uh, sounds interesting, sounds very uh, uh, funeral-like, but the funeral home was brand new. I mean, they'd just been open a few weeks, if I remember correctly. They didn't even have a Bible in that building yet. So we went to the funeral director's office. Uh, we looked it up online, an online Bible. We learned that dust to dust, ashes to ashes is not actually in the Bible. And I'll admit, I was a little surprised. I thought, surely that's in there somewhere. I just can't remember where it was. No, it's not in there. Um, this passage is probably as close as we can get. It's very close, isn't it? Um, but as I thought about it, though, I decided this is not really the thought the person was hoping for. <laughs> this isn't really the, the comforting passage that we might have imagined. So because he had sinned, Adam will eventually die. And that's really, anyway, that's, I don't think the, the theme of that particular funeral, that's not what we were trying to communicate. But anyway, thought I'd note that a lot of times people hear dust to dust, ashes to ashes, and assume that's in the Bible. And, uh, it does not appear to be. Uh, let's close tonight by looking at Genesis 3, verses 20 through 24. Genesis 3, 20 through 24. Now the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Well, first of all, Eve isn't Eve until we get to verse 20. So with the talk of childbirth, he now names her Eve, a word apparently going back to the idea of life. She is the giver of life. She is the mother of all living. And notice this does not fit in with evolutionary theory. I mean, obviously, in evolutionary theory, we've got this evolution from non-living matter to living matter, and then the living matter gets more and more complicated over time. And, you know, where does Eve plug in there? That, that does not fit with this passage. Well, the second thing happening in this passage is that the Lord God apparently considers the fig leaves inadequate for some reason. And instead, 
makes them garments of skin. So he makes them garments of skin for Adam and Eve. And really, when we think about it, this is perhaps the first animal sacrifice, isn't it? Remember, they aren't eating meat yet. But when somebody makes a garment of skin, a death is required, isn't it? The shedding of blood takes place. So by sinning then, Adam and Eve have caused the need for the very first death. Blood is shed as a consequence of sin. This is the first of many, many sacrifices down through the years, pointing to and culminating in the death of Jesus on the cross. And it's hard for us to imagine this. I don't know if Adam and Eve were able to watch this happen. Um, doesn't say that they were able to see it. Doesn't say that they weren't. Uh, but how dramatic that would have been. Because you sinned, now I need to provide you with a, a coat of skin. And this is how I'm going to do it. And obviously, if they'd never seen that before, they never experienced or witnessed a death, that would have been a very traumatic event. And uh, certainly would have reminded them of the consequences of their sin. Now, what's interesting is that Adam and Eve still seem to be alone at this point, right? We have no reference to children yet. Uh, Cain and Abel aren't born until Genesis chapter 4. We'll get to that in a couple weeks. So I guess I would just say some have taken verse 21 as a statement on modest clothing, and in a sense, maybe it is. Um, but we do need to be careful that we don't prove too much here. Uh, as the only two people on the planet, Adam and Eve are given garments of skin. So I would say this might not be as much a modesty issue here as it is preparation for what is about to happen next. That is, they are about to get kicked out of this perfect garden paradise. And things are about to get very, very uncomfortable for them physically. They're about to need some leather clothing for the hard work that's about to happen. They'll need, I think we would say today, chaps and gloves and coats and leather shoes protecting them from the thorns and the thistles and the blisters and all of these other things that they would experience. And this is what happens next. God speaks to himself again. Notice the us uh, with reference to uh, verse 22 there, God decides that in order to prevent people from living forever, having access to the tree of life, he will now kick them out of the garden. So they've eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Therefore, to put a limit on these sinful creatures, God sets a limit. And I think we understand the wisdom of that. If we could imagine the most evil people who've ever lived and then imagine them living forever... Uh, think about a Hitler who was unable to die. Every evil person who's ever lived being unable to die. That would just be a miserable place to live. So God sets a limit on our lifespan. He drives them from the garden. He stations a cherubim with this flaming sword to guard and prevent access to the tree of life. We certainly don't like it, but I think we might see God's wisdom here. And again, just imagine a, a world full of evil people who live forever. That's, that's horrible for us to even consider. So all of us now, therefore, have a limit. All of us have an expiration date, so to speak. Uh, the clock is ticking. We can enjoy life. We might live for many years. But without access to the tree of life, all of us will die. Unless, of course, the Lord returns for us first. I would also note, though, as we noted last week, that access to the tree of life is restored, isn't it? In paradise, in heaven in the life to come. We had that reference a week or two ago to Revelation chapter 22. Uh, some have wondered, is there an angel standing guard somewhere preventing access to the tree of life right now? Is there somewhere over in the Middle East that we've never found that they've got this angel, you know, guarding? I don't know. Uh, my opinion is that the flood changes everything and that the garden was destroyed and is no longer there. That's my opinion. Um, ultimately, though, we're not given an answer in scripture, so we don't know. We do know that we no longer have access to the tree of life. Uh, some have wondered about the fruit itself, the, the fruit from the tree of no, the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, how is it usually pictured in paintings and artwork? It's an apple, isn't it? And uh, you got Eve giving this nice, shiny, bright red, huge, juicy looking apple to, uh, to uh, Adam. Uh, but no reference. It was, uh, it was definitely not an apple. And I know that because it was the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So he tells us what it is. And uh, absolutely not an apple tree. So let's just be aware of that with the artwork. In terms of several practical applications tonight, I want us to note, first of all, and there have been a number of applications I think I've pointed out throughout our study, but uh, just by, in way of summary and some a few things I don't want us to miss. Um, the role of women in New Testament worship 
is tied not only to the order of creation, as we noted last week, Adam was made first, then Eve, but it's also tied to the fact that Eve was deceived and that Adam sinned willfully. And over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul takes us back not to the culture in Ephesus. He doesn't have these limitations on women's role because Ephesus did this or that. That's not the reason for those limitations. He takes it back to the order of creation, and then he also takes it back to the fall, that the woman was deceived and Adam sinned willingly. All right, so that's maybe the first thing we should keep in mind here. The second application, um, let's also remember that sin promises more than it can deliver. Satan promised some sense of happiness, fulfillment. There's certainly something there, not in those terms, but he was suggesting that God was holding back, that God was keeping them from their full potential. And yet now, with 2020 hindsight, obviously the result is anything but that. The result of sin is fear and pain and sweat and ultimately death. Sin may seem quite appealing, but we need to look past the worm to see the hook, as I think we might have discussed in our Bible class this past Sunday. Another third practical application here is that God is not impressed by our excuses. We cannot blame somebody else and expect to somehow evade God's judgment. And what I noticed in this passage just now really was that God did not argue with those excuses, did he? He didn't say, but this, and this is why that's not valid or whatever. No, he just went in and he uh, gave the sentence. He uh, explained what the punishment was for the three individuals who were involved in this particular situation. So no excuses. I'm sure there are other uh, practical applications here. We've mentioned several throughout class tonight, uh, but these are several I thought we needed to note before we uh, before we close. Uh, this brings us to the end of our study. Next week, hopefully, we'll have a guest speaker again through World Video Bible School. Thank you for taking the time to study Genesis with us tonight. I'm looking forward to returning to Genesis chapter 4 uh, two weeks from today, if the Lord will. So let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, creator of heaven and earth. You made us, you know our weaknesses, and in your love and concern for us, you made a way for us to cover our sin. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to do just that. We ask for your blessing on those who are struggling with health concerns, not only the physical concerns that many of us have from time to time, but we ask for your special blessing tonight on those who are struggling with their mental health as well. This world can be a difficult place to live sometimes, and the pressure of life has a way of bringing us down. Bless us, Father, and we pray that you would open our eyes to all the pain around us and give us as your people the ability to strengthen and encourage. We come to you with this praise and these thanksgivings and these requests in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen.